I'm Dr. Danny. I'm gonna tell you how much of our brain we actually use and how yoga and meditation can help you use your brain better. So after the movie Lucy came out, many people are asking the question, so how much of our brains do we actually use? What percentage? And is it a myth that we only use 10% of our brain? And the answer is yes, it's a total myth. Many neuroscientists have recently been interviewed about this topic, and for example, Dr. Barry Gordon, who is a US behavioral neurologist, and he's a cognitive neuroscientist, he recently told Scientific America that we use virtually every part of our brain, and that most of the brain is active almost all of the time. The brain uses a disproportionate, meaning a larger amount of calories, based on its body weight. Your brain is only 3% of your total body weight but it uses 20% of your body's total energy and your calories because it's so what we call metabolically active, meaning it's using so much sugar and calories all the time, even when you sleep. In fact, when you're asleep, different parts of your brain become active and your brain produces more slow waves than when you're awake, but the brain definitely does not shut down every night when your head hits the pillow. In the transition from being awake to being asleep, the sleep promoting areas of your brain are most active, like the parts of the hypothalamus called the VLPO nucleus. And these sleep areas, they get active and they inhibit brain activity that's responsible for promoting being awake like something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, and that is what makes you get to sleep. Sometimes also think that us humans use more of our brains than other mammals, like cats or dogs, and that's why we're so much smarter. But that's actually not true either. What determines intelligence are things like the size of something called your prefrontal cortex, the number of cortical neurons, and the conduction velocity, meaning in plain English, how fast your brain cells talk to each other, and how fast and how well they process really complex information. So where did this 10% myth begin? Well, the 10% statement may have started from a misquote of Albert Einstein, according to some sources, or there's someone called Dr. Carl Lashley working in the 1920s, and he was doing research on rat and removing large areas of their brains, and then he found that the animals could still relearn some specific tasks, even without a fully intact brain. And we also know that it's true that if you lose a part of the brain due to a stroke, for example, or a brain injury, especially if it happens before you reach adulthood, that the brain has an incredible ability to adapt thanks to something called neuroplasticity, where your undamaged areas of your brain can actually take over tasks that the damaged part of your brain used to do. And that's why it's possible to recover speech or recover being able to speak after you've had a stroke, even in an aging brain and if you're an older adult. The myth has also been perpetuated about this 10% of the brain through advertising and popular culture because many companies over the years have used this 10% of your brain myth in their advertising campaigns. For example, there's one airline that supposedly had an ad campaign years ago that said something like, it's said that we use a mere 10% of our brain capacity. If, however, you're flying with us, you're using considerably more. So it's just been in the public consciousness for a long time, this idea about 10%. So we do use all of the brain at certain times, depending on what we're doing. There are, however, different neural networks that are active or lighting up at certain times. When you're daydreaming or you're just kind of sitting there and not really engaged in any directed activity and just kind of doing nothing, something called the brain's default mode network is active and lighting up. And key differences in this default mode network and how the default mode network talks to the other parts of the network can lead to better coping with stress and being able to quiet the mind versus not being able to shut off thoughts when you're meditating. So for example, the default mode network has two parts. If the anterior part and the posterior part of this network are not talking to each other well, then you have trouble quieting your mind. But just because we use more of our brain doesn't mean you can't improve your brain capacity. We do this all the time when we learn something new and when we train our brains to do something new specifically. So calming the limbic system and decreasing our fight or flight response so our brains are primed to learn actually helps you increase your brain power because you can't learn if you're in fight or flight overdrive and the brain thinks you're running away constantly from a saber tooth tiger. And that's often the state of our mind that we exist in in the modern world and that's because the brain gets confused and thinks we're running away from a tiger but we just have these constant little stresses of modern life. And that's what yoga and meditation does for your brain. It helps you break the brain stress cycle so you can improve your brain power. So when you meditate and when you do yoga to calm your brain and improve your focus and concentration, you are actually changing your neural networks. 
you're decreasing the activity of the brain areas related to mindless mental chatter, like something called the PCC, and you're increasing activity of brain areas like the anterior cingulate gyrus. You're actually creating new connections between multiple brain cells at one time, so you're actually improving how well your brain cells get to talk to each other. And basically this means you get rid of static over the telephone switchboard in your brain. So I hope this gives you some cool facts to impress a friend about busting the myth about only using 10% of your brain. And if you don't already meditate or do yoga regularly, I recommend starting with a simple 15 minute practice at home each day. And if you want some help getting started, check out my Mind Body Medicine Crash Course with beginner yoga videos, meditations, and guided recordings to help you out.